That? Um. All right, so let me introduce Charles Wagner. He's from comes down here from Oklahoma. He's going to talk to us about how to stabilize wood, what kind of tools he uses, chambers. He's going to talk about vacuum pumps, and I believe you're going to talk about a kiln as well. I uh, can. All right, and the different colors of wood, how to stabilize it, what products to use, and the whole bit. So let me introduce Charles Wagner. Well, thank you. I want to grab it. I'm a member of the uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Central Oklahoma Wood Turners Association, and uh, I've been playing with stabilizing wood for oh, about three years now. And I actually decided to start building my own chambers. And I have chambers, I sell pumps, and uh, information on my stuff is over there. I have nowhere near enough papers. Uh, I printed out 50 of these. So if you'd like to pass these around. I, okay. Real quickly, what me, I'll, I'll tell you what recycling or what stabilizing wood is all about. Uh, basically, what we do is we take a wood that would not be suitable for turning, um, extremely punky or maybe a wood that is not of the density that we would desire to have it. And we impregnate, we impregnate that wood with a methacolate resin. Uh, this particular product is called cactus juice. And uh, there's, there's several products out there on the market. They're all a, a form of methacolate resin. And what we do is, uh, like I say, we use a vacuum system to impregnate that. And what I'd like to do tonight is basically go through the steps in the process. It's a very safe, very uh, easy procedure. Uh, last week I gave a demonstration uh, at the uh, Hunt County uh, Wood Turners, and uh, we had processed a little piece of wood, and one of the gentlemen from the uh, Wood Turners uh, Club there. Uh, took the wood home and turned it, and this is a result of that. What I'd like to do is to pass around some of the wood. Uh, he probably wants that back, so let's make sure it doesn't end up in some pocket somewhere. Um, this is a piece of unstabilized um, uh, um, spalted maple. This is a piece of stabilized spalted maple. Typically what we will do is we will double the density of the wood and double the weight. This is a piece of holly. Um, being American holly, that big of a piece, I probably ought to have insurance on it. Um, but I'm an ornamental turner. Uh, you have several members in the club here that are ornamental turners. Uh, one of them... Uh, is uh, Jeff Edwards is doing phenomenal work in the world of ornamental turning on his Rose engine. And the thing is, the majority of us use African blackwood. The reason for that is it's extremely dense. Uh, one of the reasons I became an ornamental turner is there's no such thing as sanding. Uh, I if I never touched another piece of sandpaper the rest of my life, I'd just be perfectly happy about it. Uh, it takes extremely sharp details in, in the cutting for ornamental turning, and if the wood isn't extremely stable and extremely dense, it won't take those patterns. Uh, this holly is just, it's, it's unbelievable how you can treat that. One of the, there's another piece of very punky, uh, Spalted maple, almost looks like ambrosia, but it's not. Um, these pieces here um, is um, no crud. Um, well, I went totally brain dead. The, the wood that has the uh, the red in it. 
Box Elder Chimney, thank you. I, I, wow. Anyway, this is Box Elder, um, and it's been dyed red. I'll talk a little bit about how to do the dyeing. Two sides of this has been ran through the joiner, two sides have not. So this will give you an idea of what it looks like when the resin is completed prior to cleaning it off the wood. Um, the vacuum process is a rather unique process. I don't think the majority of the people recognizes the strength of vacuum. Uh, it, it can produce an unbelievable amount of pressure on, on a piece of material. This is a block of wood that was, uh, had a little dye in the resin. I processed it, normal processing, and then we cut it in half. And you can see that the material is just as same color on the inside as on the outside, basically proving that the resin goes all the way through. That little box that was passed around, the process that we did last Thursday night was extremely abbreviated, but yet uh, I'm told that uh, the resin had saturated the wood all the way through. So this is just another sample of that. Okay, um, I, I use a lot of spalded maple simply because I have a lot of spalded maple. I have a good friend in Iowa that uh, gives it to me, and uh, so I use a great deal of it. Let me, let me kind of go through the process of exactly how you stabilize the wood. We take and put the wood in a... In this case, I have a uniquely designed wood carrier, and um, that's, a, that's a plug for my systems. And we simply put that wood in the carrier, and we put it in the vacuum chamber. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this wood and the preparation. The wood needs to be extremely dry prior to putting it into a vacuum situation because we would be pulling moisture out of the wood. That creates two problems. Number one, it contaminates the resin. And number two, it will screw up a vacuum pump in a heartbeat, especially an electric vacuum pump. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about vacuum pumps. Uh, electric vacuum pumps are very, very sensitive to what uh, the materials you pull through them. They like to just have dry air. So what we do is we take wood that's typically 12, 13, 14 percent moisture content, just, you know, what, what would be sitting around here. And we take that wood and we put it into an oven. And the oven that I use, uh, the first oven I used was my kitchen oven. And uh, we did that once. Uh, my wife came home and uh, she instantly wanted to know what that smell was in the kitchen. And... Unfortunately, uh, I'd had experience many, many years ago in building a fire inside a microwave oven, so she doesn't trust me too much in her kitchen anymore. So I went to Sam's and I purchased a large toaster oven. Uh, they're $74 um, at Sam's. Any type of toaster oven will work, but this particular one is really quite nice. It's about that wide, about that high. Mm -hmm probably every bit of that deep, and it has a little circulation fan in it. Now, they're going to try to convince you, uh, I think it's made by Oster or something like that, they're going to try to convince you that it's a, uh, a convection oven. No, it's an oven that's got a little fan in it that moves the hot air, but it does an excellent job. The only thing about that particular oven, as with every other toaster oven in the world, is the thermostats on them are unbelievably cheap and unbelievably inaccurate. So what you need, they work, but you never quite know where they're going to come on and go off. We want the oven or the wood to be treated, uh, if we're drying the wood out, somewhere around 250 degrees. This little therm uh, thermometer here costs about $5. Uh, it's available from Walmart. Uh, or any, any uh, store that sells uh, kitchen appliances, I strongly encourage 
anyone using the oven to purchase one of those. Uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to maintain that temperature around 200 degrees, a little bit better than that. And I'll explain why that's so critically important here in just a little bit. Once you put that wood in the oven and you want to dry it down, you want to try to bring that moisture content as close to zero as possible. I normally just let it run overnight and it doesn't create a problem. Uh, it does a nice job bringing the moisture content down. Now, if you've got a moisture meter, don't waste your time. If you, most moisture meters are not going to measure anything below 5%. If you really hung up on it and you want to know desperately how much moisture content there is in it, then you're going to have to weigh the wood to, to find out. But the bottom line is if you let it go for 24 hours at 200 degrees, that wood is going to be dry enough that it's going to work perfectly in a stabilizing situation. The thing is important here is when you pull that wood out of that oven, you want to immediately seal that wood up as it's cooling down because if you don't, it's going to pull that moisture right back into it. As a matter of fact, it will probably pull more moisture into it than what it originally started with. So, and, and Ziploc bags, by the way, don't work worth a moment, uh, worth a darn. Um, just ask any... Uh, uh, guy that sells drugs if he puts his drugs in Ziploc bags because that dog can smell it a mile away because they leak. Uh, air goes right through uh, the, the bags. But again, find a spouse that's extremely cooperative. Go to the kitchen, get your seal a meal or um, food saver bags, and they're, they're extremely air resistant. I typically take the wood straight out of the oven. <coughs> excuse me, take the wood straight out of the oven and put it in one of these seal -a meal bags and just pull a vacuum on it and seal it. I have them sitting around my shop. They may sit there for a month and they stay perfectly sealed and perfectly dry. Uh, you do not want to take the wood straight out of the oven and start your vacuuming process. The reason for that is cactus juice, that, that the whole process is we take the wood we put it into a vacuum chamber, we pull a vacuum on the wood, and the, the wood is submerged in, in the cactus juice, which I will go ahead and just do this right now. And you pull all the air out of the uh, cell structure the, of the wood, and once you release the vacuum, since the wood is totally submerged in the cactus juice, instead of air being sucked back into that wood, we suck cactus juice into it. The rules, um, the, the standard rule out there is that the amount of time that it takes to pull the air out of the wood, once you release that vacuum, you let the wood soak in the cactus juice for double that amount of time. Now the most interesting thing about this process is there is nothing out there that you can do, any of these steps that you can overdo. You can certainly underdo a lot of them, but you cannot overdo it. So if in typically a, a couple blocks of wood like that will pull all the air out of the wood in probably 30 to 45 minutes. That's the reason that you buy this material handler from me, and it holds the wood down. If you have your own vacuum chambers, yeah, you're going to have to take a piece of metal. I've seen guys use uh, sockets and, and all kinds of things to, to hold the wood down. Yes, it will absolutely float. The interesting thing is when the process is done, the wood will not float. But yes, you need to keep the wood totally submerged. Do you have a question, sir? No, no, you do not want those ends sealed. Uh, and, and that's an interesting point. If you have a, uh, a wood that has been um, sealed with wax um, or you have anchor seal on the ends of the wood, I would recommend you cut that anchor seal off. Uh, in the case of uh, waxed wood, buy some of the stuff out here. Believe it or not, the easiest and the fastest way of removing that wax from that wood 
is to toss it in a bucket of boiling water because it will take that wax right off the wood. You pull the wood out, let it dry overnight. Believe it or not, the moisture content is not going to go up in the wood. That's, that's the easiest and fastest way. But you do, uh, I treat a lot of, of wood with, the, uh, with anchor seal. And uh, I just normally go on the bandsaw and just trim off an eighth of an inch off each end to get rid of that anchor seal. Good question. Um, now what we're going to do here, the wood is in here. It's, it's not floating. And this is a good question because if it does float, we're in trouble. And it's, it's merged in cactus juice. We're going to pull a vacuum on this. One of the things that will happen is there in the liquid, there's a great deal of air, and there's a great deal of air in here. This cactus juice will start boiling and bubbling away. What you don't want it to do is for the cactus juice to boil up, get into this tube, and go into a vacuum pump. And as soon as I get this process going, you're going to see that. And how you control that is you control the amount of vacuum. In a normal process, it normally takes about five minutes for that material to stabilize, for the liquid to stop bubbling, and for your process. During that first five, six minutes, you have to watch this very closely and adjust the level of vacuum. After that is done, you can let it go under full vacuum and um, wait until all the air is pulled out of the wood. Typically, again, I, have in, I cannot overemphasize the fact that you cannot overdo this. I will oftentimes uh, put my wood in here and I'll fill this chamber up. I will put the cactus juice in it and I will start the vacuum once it's uh, settled down and I don't have to babysit it any longer. I'll just leave and let it go. And typically, I'll let it run overnight. So you, uh, again, you can't pull too much out of it. Are we plugged in? Uh, OK. OK. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start this, and then uh, I want to talk to you about the vacuum pumps. But um, this, we will probably be pulling somewhere around 28 inches of vacuum. Um, I think you're about 450 feet elevation here. so. You can't pull 32, 33 inches of vacuum like some guys think. But we're going to start this up very quickly. And if you notice, the, the vacuum chamber has a seal on it. And it just simply sits on there. And once the vacuum starts, um, this is just a valve to, to relieve the, the vacuum. It will start very quickly. And we will see the air coming out. Now, if I, if I shut this down big time, it's going to start foaming down there. Um, and that foam will just continue to increase. But if you break the vacuum down a little bit, and we're pulling mm, about 23, 24 inches of vacuum here, it will settle down. And we're going to let it uh, run there for just a little bit. And I'll just gently close this over the next few minutes. And it will do it. It's also pulling, I don't know if you can see that or not, there's, there's all kinds of bubbles coming out of there. Okay. Um, those bubbles are basically the air that's being pulled out of the wood. Um, while that's kind of settling down, let's talk about vacuum pumps. This is a JB vacuum pump. It's probably one of the most commonly used uh, vacuum pumps in the... Uh, uh, heating and air conditioning uh, community. It's manufactured in Indiana. It's one of the very few pumps that is manufactured in the United States. The uh, uh, duty cycle on this pump is continuous. Uh, the HVAC guys will take that particular pump, hook it up to a heating and uh, to an air conditioning system, and uh, on a large commercial building like this, they may drive away and come back a week later to check it. Uh, it will actually run that long. The, uh, it's, it's a fantastic pump. You can buy pumps. Um, uh, Robin, um, um, there, there, there's a number of brands of pumps out there, including Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight makes a uh, 
two-stage vacuum pump that will pull 28 pounds of, of vacuum uh, does a decent job. The only problem is, is these pumps are uh, filled with oil, a very, very highly refined oil, by the way, that runs anywhere between 8 and $12 a quart. Um, it will blow oil out and uh, an oil mist out. Your cheaper pumps will tend to do that. Gast is another brand of pump that is very common. You can find them on eBay. Um, a frugal, the, the frugal vacuum system, the guy that makes the, uh, that does the little rebuilt pumps and uh, um, for uh, vacuum chucking, um, he uses a, a, a gas pump. Uh, most of them are pretty darn good. They will pull a uh, high vacuum. Gas does make pumps that will only pull 23, 24 inches of vacuum. You need a pump that will pull better than 25 inches. 25 inches is a minimum amount of vacuum you want for uh, good stabilization. Okay, see this has settled down fairly well now. So, and, and we're pulling a lot of air. You can see the air coming out of the wood here. Now this wood has been sitting there since last week in an unsealed bag, so it may have a little moisture content. It's no big deal. The uh, other type of pump is a Venturi pump. And unfortunately, Venturi pumps get a, a bad reputation because there are, for every good Venturi pump out there, there's a million terrible ones. And unfortunately, some of our stores in the woodworking community sell some of those pumps. They charge outrageous prices for them, and they're outrageously terrible. They will typically operate, they will pull better than 25 inches of vacuum, but they will also pull at least 4 CFM off of an air compressor, and that's a continuous operation. Um, the industry uses Venturi vacuum pumps by the millions. This particular pump is manufactured in Massachusetts. Oh, by the way, those other pumps are all manufactured in China. This pump is manufactured in Massachusetts. It draws 0.8 CFM of air. Sure. It pulls 0.8 CFM of air at 60 pounds pressure and it will produce 28 inches of vacuum in doing so. This little pump, I, I sell this pump with a hose set up, everything ready to go for $89. I also have one over here that's $424. It's exactly the same pump, except, well, it's a lot higher. I make more money off this one, by the way, than I do that one. The problem, the, the Vacuum saver pump, which is really a, a very, very neat s system, is it has a, a, a sensor on it that is totally pneumatic. And once you reach the vacuum level that you have it adjusted for, say 27 inches, it will shut the air compressor off and it will lock the vacuum line. And then, once the vacuum chamber drops down three CFM, or I mean three inches, it will turn back on and run. I have a large vacuum kiln that I use at the house. I've been prototyping for some time. This thing will typically operate maybe once every 30 minutes for about three minutes. This particular pump here works just great. Like I say, I have a two horsepower, or, well, Sears calls it a two horsepower. It's a two gallon pancake compressor. If that's two horsepower, then I'm a 200 horsepower, but nevertheless, this little pump here will cause that little two gallon compressor to come on maybe every 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and run for two or three minutes until it pumps back up. The critical thing is, and why these are so efficient, is we're only using 60 pounds of air pressure. Most of your vacuum systems around the shop, 
is probably set at 100 pounds at least. Some of them is 120. You need to put a line regulator on. These can be purchased, by the way, the ones at Harbor Freight works as good as, as the ones at Granger's. The difference Harbor Freight, I think, are about $6, and Granger's want 60 um, You need to adjust this at 60 pounds coming into the Venturi. And the reason you'd think, well, if, if I can get this vacuum at, 20, uh, at, at 60 pounds pressure, if I increase my pressure, the Venturi is going to increase the vacuum. What will happen is because these things are so well machined and designed, if you go much above that design pressure, you will set up a turbulence inside the Venturi and you will actually be reducing the, the, the pressure. I can take this, and according to the manufacturer's rep, I can take this and bump it up to about 66 pounds, maybe 10%, and it works fine. It will give me a maybe another half inch of vacuum. I turn it up to 70 pounds, I'll drop down about a pound. I turn it to 80 pounds, I'll drop down two pounds. I, I, I'm sorry, two inches of vacuum. So that's one of the reasons these little pumps are very efficient. The nice thing about this particular pump is it is a straight through design. This is the pump right here, the little square part. This is a muffler and a silencer. And it's really not very noisy. It's not as noisy as that pump is right there. Um, but the thing is, is if you should happen to suck cactus juice through it, or if you have some green wood in here, I say green wood, uh, wood with a higher moisture content, we are reaching a, a vacuum level here that the water in that wood will boil at a very low temperature. Typically, uh, at, at 28 inches of vacuum, the water will boil at 90, 94 degrees, something like that. The problem is, as you're boiling that water off, you're also pulling sap out of that wood with that water. It's a, it's a nasty material. This pump here, it will contaminate the pump and block it off. There are uh, vacuum systems out there that have blockages or as secondary chambers that will trap that uh, moisture. But there again, you know, we're, we're getting into expensive systems doing that. These, it pushes that moisture from the wood right on through the vacuum pump and has no impact on it whatsoever. Um, Sure. Yeah, there, there's still going to be sap in the wood. Because we're not trying to pull that sap out. And, of course, when that wood hits zero moisture content in the oven, there's still, obviously, saps. And, and contrary, you know, most people tell you there's no such thing as oils in wood. You know, they, they sell all kinds of oil out here to recondition wood. I've never cut a tree down yet and had it leak oil. But it will leak sap. And, okay. Um, but, yes, there still is. Now what we're doing here is, is we're boiling, it, it's boiling the, uh, if you can see that down there, it's, it's, it's pulling a lot of air out of those two little pieces of very punky wood. We're going to have a very successful evening here. Um, I should mention that typically, um, you know, for the sake of ocean, all that, wear safety glasses and... Uh, you should probably be wearing gloves if you're sensitive to, to the resins. Honestly, this is a water-soluble material. Um, very, very safe. Um, where's our dentist friend? Oh, there we go. Here's our little cup turner. And we talked about this last week, and he can, he can go into a lot more details on the chemistry of the resin than I can. But being a methacolate resin, there's, there's a whole family of them. The material that he uses to make dental appliances is basically very similar to this resin. Comes out of the same family. So it, it's a safe material. Now, I don't recommend you go drinking it, but nevertheless. And I should have put safety glasses on because I am very sensitive to that. Uh, to the need for safety glasses. Okay, 
We're pulling the air out of the wood. We're going to let the, the air, we're going to let the vacuum run until we are satisfied that all the air is pulled out of the wood. In the case of this evening, we're probably shut off here pretty quick. Once we shut the vacuum off, we open this up, the cactus juice is going to be pulled back into the wood. You want it to sit there and soak a while. Um, everyone in that's doing this says it needs to soak at least twice as long as you pull the vacuum. My take is 97, 98% of that cactus juice is sucked into that wood when it goes from 28 inches of vacuum to normal atmospheric pressure in a matter of minutes. I have marked the, the, the level of the vacuum, and it's amazing because you take, you fill this cylinder half full of wood, and you have a couple inches of, of uh, cactus juice above it. When you cut that vacuum off, it will suck it down just like that. And I've seen it drop as much as an inch and a half. Uh, that one block of wood that's sitting around here that doubled the weight, uh, that has quite a bit of cactus juice in it. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you the old college professor answer. It depends. It depends on the, the density of the wood, the porosity of the wood, um, the, the level of vacuum in some respects. I don't think that's a major point. But the bottom line is it's very difficult. Um, I will recover 90% of this wood, okay? Um, there's that one block, there's a block that is being passed around, um, that, that larger block. There's some weights put on it, and I believe there was uh, something like seven and a half ounces. The wood weighed seven and a half ounces when I started, and it ended up around 14 ounces, which basically means that, well, maybe it's not on these samples. Okay. Um, Basically, a block like this is probably going to take five or six ounces of cactus juice. There's 128 ounces in there, okay? Does that answer the question? Thank you very much. Okay. Now, once we, once we have saturated the wood with the cactus juice, we will take the wood out and we wrap it in aluminum foil. The important point is, is you wrap each and every piece in aluminum foil. Don't take, if, if you're making pencil blanks or, or finial blanks um, and you've got three or four of these, <laughs> don't, don't take them and, and wrap them like this because when you do, after we pull it out of the oven here, and I'll explain that in a moment, you're going to have one block of material. So you wrap each one of them up with uh, aluminum foil. And again, I buy uh, the, the aluminum foil from uh, Sam's. I should run out of this in about 2097. Um, it, it's, it's a lot heavier uh, than, than regular household material. It, it's really nice to work with. But you wrap it up and you wrap it just as tight as you possibly can. And the reason for that is once you start heating the cactus juice in the oven, it becomes extremely thin and it will run out. Now, I should point out, when you looked at this piece of wood, you saw some really rotted material here. Cactus juice will not fill gaps. It's not going to fill cracks in wood and it's not going to add any structural strength to those cracks, okay? All it is doing is filling the cell structure of the wood itself. And um, you can look in the bottom of my uh, toaster oven, and it's got a layer of cactus juice in the bottom of it. It's baked on because uh, some of my aluminum will leak. Makes it easier in some respects. Uh, the segmenters 
enjoy using the stabilized wood for a couple of reasons. Number one is you can take a, a, a dense wood and a very uh, light wood and um, if, if the woods are stabilized, first thing, there's very little movement in this wood once it's stabilized because, well, this is virtually half plastic. Uh, the second thing is uh, you're not affecting it. It will glue up quite fine. Uh, I've used Type Bond too and never had a drop of trouble with it. Um, the, the segmenters, that, to, to my knowledge, I've never heard a segmenter complain about it. Okay. Um, once you get it wrapped up in the aluminum foil, at that point in time, again, as I've emphasized, you're not in any rush. Uh, I've had wood lay around my shop for weeks on end wrapped up in aluminum foil. But once it's wrapped up, what you do is you take your toaster oven, or if your spouse is on a trip, you fire up your kitchen oven. And, and by the way, let me explain two things. Number one, seriously, if you do it, in, and even on a toaster oven, take a piece of aluminum foil and put down underneath it. Because you can think, oh my gosh, I have this wrapped to no, there's no way in the world it's going to leak. Yeah, it is. Just trust me. The moment that you expect it not to, it's going to. So if you do this in the kitchen, what it's going to smell like, <coughs> excuse me, is if you've ever um, put plexiglass on a table saw or, or cut it with a saw or grinder, uh, it has that, that plastic smell, and that's it. It's not, it's not toxic. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill the cat or the canary. Um, but uh, you're going to have a little smell to it. It's, it's kind of a... Almost a, a, a very light, burnt plastic smell. Okay. Get your oven up to temperature at 200 degrees before you put the wood in it. Put your wood in and just walk away. Now, the critical part is the resin will cure, polymerize, at 200 degrees, actually it's 196 degrees if you want to get technical about it. There's different polymerization levels on different types of uh, methacrylate. You guys, what, 150 something probably? Okay. There's a, this particular material, we say 200 degrees. The internal temperature, the core temperature of this wood, needs to be at 200 degrees for a minimum of eight to nine minutes. That will ensure that the plastic goes through a complete polymerization process and totally cures. The problem is, if you don't know what the temperature is on the oven, even though the little dial says it's 200 degrees, it might be 145 degrees. If you partially polymerize, uh, polymerize the resin, it stops its polymerization process at that point, and you cannot redo it. So what you end up with is a resin that is not cured, typically in the center of the wood, and it's going to be kind of liquidy or soft. Okay. So what do I do? Fall back to rule number one. You can't overdo anything uh, in this process. I'll put it into the oven in the evening, I make sure my oven is in a very safe place in the shop in case it decides to go up in flames, and I leave. Come back the next morning and take it out of the oven. Um, I've never had a problem. You can't, you can't overcook it. You don't want to go much above 200 degrees. Now, can you go above 200 degrees? Yes. What happens if you do? That liquid becomes much thinner. I've known some people that... So, oh, I can, I can do it a whole lot faster at 250 degrees. Yeah, they can. And they've got a layer of resin in the bottom of their ovens about that thick where, it, I mean, it becomes, it makes water look like oil at those sort of temperatures. So best thing to do is hang around the 200 degrees minimum. There is another system out there that the big guys use in the commercial world when they're stabilizing wood. 
By the way, wood's been stabilized since the uh, uh, late 40s. The, uh, the uh, U.S. Forestry uh, Products Labs in Madison, Wisconsin has been doing this for decades. The one way that you can guarantee that you get the right temperature for the wood and you don't have to worry about it is to go back, put your aluminum wrapped wood in one of these bags, seal the bag up, and put it into a pot of boiling water. That water's going to boil somewhere around 212 degrees, 210 degrees based on the uh, altitude. It's a perfect situation. You're never going to go beyond 210 degrees, and you're not going to go below 210 degrees if it's boiling. You sit there and let it boil for 30, 45 minutes to an hour, I can assure you that resin is going to be totally cured. It's a very good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. it the, the interesting thing, well, sure you can. Sure you can. And, and you can do it too. Trust me, you can do it. Because here's the thing. This is sealed. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you trust your sealing meal bags? Your, your food savers? By the way, your sp spaghetti pot is probably not big enough. And besides that, you're going to have to boil the water. I did the next best thing. I went out and bought me an electric uh, turkey fryer. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear from the pump. Oh, yeah, absolutely no odor. The only thing you're going to have is boiling water. Everything's contained inside that bag. Yeah, and once it cools down, by the way, there's not going to be any odor whatsoever. I'm sorry? You need to, yeah, yeah. You can't let it, well, it could float probably, but you need to weight it down. It will sink. Yeah, I can assure you, this block of, this block of wood right here that's not stabilized, I can assure you, you're going to put weight on it to float. It's, it's going to float. This sink like a lead anchor. Okay, typically you don't have a problem. See, he's, he, he does the same. He processes his dentures and, and the, the, the dental appliances in water. And, and there's, there's a couple of reasons beyond what we're trying to do here that he, he uses water. But um, talk to your local dentists. They're, they're experts on this stuff. Um, or, or the dental technicians are. And by the way, that... We've almost boiled tonight or, or vacuumed tonight longer than we did last week. And the interesting thing was that was a block about the same size as a block I put in here, about two inches square. And the resin was saturated all the way to the center of the block. And when you, I didn't know you put it in the water. The water is a neat way of doing it. The only thing is you want to make sure it doesn't boil dry. And uh, your turkey fryer is fine. You can take it out and put oil or water in it and cook your turkey in it the next day. Now, let me tell you the reason that you need to buy one of these chambers. It has nothing to do with wood stabilization. The quickest and the fastest way there is to um, tenderize your meat to... Um, what, what, what do we want to call it? Um, marinade, thank you. Marinade the meat. Gosh, I'm totally brain dead tonight. Is to take that meat, put it in a bowl, or put it into a, a Ziploc bag. Don't seal it. Leave the Ziploc bag open. Set it in your vacuum chamber, because you don't want that mess in your vacuum chamber. And pull a vacuum, and by the way, put your marinating sauce in the meat, and pull a vacuum on it for about three minutes, and I guarantee you, you've got the most marinated meat in town. And you think, well, this is stupid. Well, Bed Bath & Beyond sells vacuum marinating systems that works on exactly the same principle, except you can't stabilize wood with it.
because it won't pull the vacuum necessary for the wood. Um, that's, that's a good way. Another thing, I am building some larger chambers, some 12 inch and some 18 inch chambers. One of them's going to, actually about four of them's going to be 30 inches high. Um, and um, your, your club member, um, Jeff Edwards, does a lot of green turning, and then he will soak the wood in alcohol. And for, oh, I don't know, three or four days, a week or something, whatever Jeff does, and then he will take it out, put it in a, a paper bag, and let it set on the shelf for several months. I took a about an eight ounce or an eight inch diameter bowl that I had turned that the tree was cut on a Wednesday. I turned it on a Friday, and boy, is that easy turning! <laughs> uh, it was uh, hackberry. I turned the bowl about a quarter inch thick. You know, it was about the size of very similar to this right here. And I turned it about a quarter inch thick. Everyone told me that there was no way in the world that that bowl was going to be dry and I'd have enough surface material to uh, turn that wood once it was dry because it was going to warp beyond that quarter inch. I put it into a vacuum chamber. I put alcohol in there. I pulled a vacuum on it for about three hours, basically until it, 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 it stopped bubbling indicating that all the air had been pulled out of the wood. I released it. The alcohol was sucked into the wood. I immediately took it out of there, put it into a paper bag, and a week and a half later, I turned a bowl that had an 11% moisture content on it, and I turned it down to about an eighth of an inch wall thickness, and I doubt very seriously what it had warped as much as a sixteenth of an inch. There was absolutely no cracks or checks in it, which is kind of hard to do with hackberry. So that's another process that you can do with, with your vacuum system is to accelerate the drying of the wood. I, I think there was probably more to it than just the acceleration um, because I, I think the fact that we had the um, alcohol the, the wood totally saturated with the alcohol increased the, the or decreased the, the tension on the wood. And uh, I, th I think it really worked. Now, do I have any scientific evidence about it? Nope. I've got a bowl at home that looks pretty darn good right now. But, uh, yes. Yeah, the cheapest alcohol you can buy. Uh, Go down to your local paint supply, and I think you can buy for what eight, nine, ten dollars a gallon, something like that. Okay, it's denatured alcohol. Can't drink it. You might drink cactus juice and get by with. Well, don't drink that stuff. Okay, that is basically the process. Let me talk to you a little bit about dyeing the wood. Uh, this was dyed. Um, this was dyed. The interesting thing about dyeing the wood is this is a, a dye that is manufactured by aluminite 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 uh, it is totally compatible with the, the uh, methacolate resins and uh, you can take the aniline dyes in a powder form and use them with the resins they're kind of they're kind of hard to mix but they will mix with the resin, and, and you can use it. The, uh, the super saturated dye here that's about $20 a bottle that you can mix with alcohol or water and make uh, two quarts, I, I've never used that. It would probably work. I don't think there's a problem with it. Do not use any dyes that have an alcohol base or a water base simply because you're mixing it with your resin and you're going to be contaminating your resin. The best stuff to use is stuff that's designed for resins. The thing is, we're only dyeing the open cell structure in the wood. We're not dyeing the, the fibers themselves. 
So you will, you will look at the dye, and it will almost look black. It is so concentrated. Um, the dye that, this red dye that I mixed, honest to gosh, it looked just like that. In, in the little cup that I had it mixed in. I thought, boy, that's going to be a beautiful red. Well, the red is a beautiful red. The only problem is, is it didn't have any impact on the fibers. So it becomes very difficult to get strong colors with just the resin. There's other things you can do. You can dye the wood with an aniline dye, let it dry out, and then dye with the cactus juice, and you can get some unbelievably bright colors in the wood. A lot of the guys out there in the pin turning world are dyeing two and three different colors, uh, and, and they're doing it that way. They're dyeing with the wood, the raw wood with the inline dye, letting it dry, and then uh, going in, and some of them will mix a strong solution using the aluminite dyes, one color, let it run in a vacuum chamber for a few minutes, pull it out, let it sit there for a while, basically cure out a little bit, and then put it in another colored dye. There's all kinds of things you can do. You can get onto uh, Facebook and you can see some of these uh, some of these blanks that some of these guys have more time on their hands than I do, uh, coming up with some absolutely beautiful colors. There's another little trick with this that you can do. I thought I think $120 a board foot out here for uh, the uh, ebony. Take basswood. It certainly doesn't cost $120 a board foot. Dye up black with aniline dye. Use cactus juice. Use a black dye in the cactus juice. Treat it. And you have a material that will turn like African blackwood or like ebony for a finial. As a matter of fact, I've seen some of them done that you can't tell the difference between African blackwood and that uh, basswood. It's almost impossible to believe that. Okay, for... Well, a while. There's an easier way of doing that. You go down to Harbor Freight and you pay $45 or something like that, and you buy a pressure pot. And you put that aniline dye in your wood in a pressure pot and pressurize it to about 20 pounds. Now the Harbor Freight vacuum pots are, has a, a shutoff, um, a safety valve on them at 45 pounds. Not in my shop. Uh, I'm not going over about 20, 25 pounds. 25 pounds, 20 pounds will work absolutely great. You pressurize it at 20 pounds, and it, it's going to go all the way through that wood. And you let it sit there, again, overnight. You know, Just let it sit there for quite a while. But then again, you have to let that dry out. I've, uh, what little I've done, that method, I've used the uh, uh, alcohol-based. This is still boiling away, but we're going to stop it for time tonight. And uh, I just did something I shouldn't do. You don't want to turn a vacuum pump off under pressure or under vacuum. You release it. Now, we still have, well, we're pulling about 28 pounds pressure right there. And by the way, these gauges are notoriously inaccurate. Uh, you'll get gauges that are range anywhere from 25 to 30 pounds. This is the only gauge out there that's going to give you an accurate reading. Uh, it's an electronic gauge, and it will read very, very accurately. This gauge here is amazingly accurate. It's probably within a quarter pound, which all my gauges are high-end gauges. They're all made in China. I don't know if you can buy a gauge that's not made in China anymore. Uh, they're oil-filled. They're, they're a good quality gauge, but they're just within a, a pound or so, two pounds. Um, yeah. This will, this will sit there for the next three days and, and maintain the vacuum because there's nothing to leak in here. This is the, the seal 
that is used. It's a silicone seal. It's extremely soft. You can pull on that. If you can tear it, you're, you're, you're pretty strong. Uh, it does an excellent job of sealing. And we're going to release this. And you want to zoom in on that right there? Yeah, okay. Now, you, you should be able to see it. We don't have a very big block of wood on here, as well as the fact that it still has air in the wood. But it dropped a little bit. But under normal circumstances, we would let this sit for a while. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it out. And if, if anyone would like to take, there's two blocks of wood in here. If anyone would like to take it, you're welcome to it. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it needs, it needs to soak, theoretically, twice as long as, as the amount of time that you pull the vacuum. So, um, oftentimes, uh, gosh... I've let them soak two or three days at home, never had a problem. Now, let me, uh, let me tell you why we can do that. This chamber here is 100% PVC. Okay. This chamber is 100% PVC. Uh, Curtis Seebeck, Textern, is without doubt the guy that makes the cactus juice or actually bottles the cactus juice and sells it. Uh, built uh, plexiglass chambers for several years. That chamber right there is polycarbonate, 250 times stronger than plexiglass. Uh, Michael, my friend over here that came down with Oklahoma, can attest to the fact that I had a plexiglass chamber giving a demonstration at our local club uh, implode on one side. The plexiglass is not that tough. Uh, also, cactus juice will uh, uh, attack the plastic over a, a, a relatively short period of time. It leaves a film on the inside of the plastic. It uh, can be washed out to a degree, but over a period of time, it can't. So uh, that chamber there, you need to pull the vacuum on it. Uh, you can, you know, pull it for hours on end. It's not going to hurt anything. But once you release the vacuum on it, you pr and you, if you're going to let it soak for a while, you probably ought to um, put your, your material to be soaked in another container. Um, I've soaked in, in the polycarbonate for six, eight hours and never had a drop of trouble. This... I can store this cactus juice in. I could leave this right here just like it is, come back two weeks later, and perform the same process. The uh, PVC is totally inert to it. That's one of the things I like about my chambers. Okay. Now, I can assure you that this is a whole lot heavier than what it was when we started. And I can pretty well assure you that it went all the way through. And you simply take that. And again, you wrap it just as. I'm gonna do. If it's gonna leak. It's gonna leak on the ends. And this is ready to go. Okay. You can, you can see a little white there on the end, kind of lighter color. I'm going to suggest that it probably needed to soak longer, obviously. Um, if we'd let this soak another 30, 45 minutes, it would have made a significant difference. You're going to be amazed at the added weight to this wood from the cactus juice. Uh, I'm still of the opinion that if you took this home tonight, 
and put it into an oven, uh, you would find that it's very stabilized. Um, does it reach the Wagner standard? No, it doesn't. But it's yeah, yeah. As long as you don't, as, as long as you don't cure it. Now, th and thank you for bringing it up. Oftentimes, especially if you got a large, uh, large load of wood in here, and it sucks the cactus juice down. If it sucks it down below the level of the wood, then you need to put some more back in and put the vacuum back on the wood again and, and pull some more vacuum on the wood. You're going to find that you, you're going to stop your air bubbles very, very quickly by doing that. Maybe another 10, 15 minutes of vacuuming. Uh, I have sneaked up on the systems, and, and when I realized that it's going to drop below the su surface of the wood, of course that top is already off, I'll immediately pour cactus juice into it, trying to keep it totally saturated or, or totally covered, and I've never had a drop of trouble with it. I did something here prior to the uh, Hunt County demonstration that I thought was probably one of the neatest things I was able to do. Um, you know, sometimes you can create some of the most phenomenal failures you've ever seen. I took a piece of wood that was very, very similar to this one in size. Well, about this size. I put it into cactus juice, and I only put the cactus juice halfway up on it. I pulled the vacuum because I wanted the bottom half of the wood to be saturated with the cactus juice and the top half to be raw wood. So I pulled vacuum on it for about three hours, released the cactus juice, and it was amazing because I just watched. The, the level of the cactus juice was about right there. I just kind of watched that liquid level go up in top of that wood. I went ahead and processed the wood. I have a, uh, a, uh, a, a instrument here, a drometer that measures the density of wood on, or in density of any material. And the interesting thing was the top part of that wood had the, basically the same density as the bottom because I had pulled such a vacuum on that wood that it sucked that cactus juice vertically into the wood. So I do not have a demonstration piece tonight showing you half of the wood treated in cactus juice and half of it not because it didn't work. It, it totally saturated that wood. Um, this is the process. And like I say, it's simple. It's um, relatively inexpensive once you uh, uh, acquire the equipment. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can build a vacuum chamber and a lot of answers to vacuum pumps. But... Um, and you can buy a lot of them on eBay. Um, but it, it does a marvelous job on the wood. You're not going to use an oil finish on it because it's not going to saturate the wood or, or soak into the wood. The interesting thing is, is I've seen, you, you, take, you take this block right here and put a good smooth finish on it, sand it down maybe 600, and put it on BO buffing system, and it will polish up like nobody's business, like there is a finish on it, because you're basically polishing plastic. So, but any type of uh, a top coat finish, lacquers, uh, uh, polyurethanes, anything, they're totally compatible. You don't have to worry about that. Schlack, lacquer, uh, polyurethanes, any of the acrylics, uh, any of the water-based materials you can use, absolutely no no problem. Uh, CA glue will work perfect for this. Yeah, it's it's totally compatible. You got to remember that you you're still dealing with with raw wood fiber in many respects. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Will the size of the wood change? Now, I'd like to tell you that was a square block. <laughs> That's not true. Um, to answer your question, 
let me, right here. This block of wood, this was turned on a metal lathe, and it was absolutely a perfect circle. The problem was this had about a 10% moisture content. The cactus juice did not affect the, the dimensions of the wood, but pulling the moisture out of it did. I'll pass that around, pass it back there. And you can see that it's kind of egg-shaped as a result. Um, a lot of people ask me, does it change the color? Yes, it will change the color to a degree. Um, I say that right there is two pieces of wood that's virtually identical. Now, for some reason, it does tend to change the color of some woods a little bit darker than other woods, um, and I'm not real sure why. Fortunately, it does not change the color of that holly that much. Now that holly was, it did yellow the holly just a little bit, but not that much. Any more questions? Yes, sir. The, the shelf life, they will tell you at normal room temperature is six months, once it's activated. Now when you buy the cactus juice, you get a one ounce, actually a little less than one ounce, of, of an activator. Uh, once you mix that with, th this cactus juice is extremely stable and has several year shelf life until you mix the activator with it. When you mix the activator with it, they will tell you that it has a six month shelf life at normal room temperature. You can refrigerate the resin and extend that life significantly. Um, some of this wood laying here was done with resin that was over a year old. But I keep all my resin in the refrigerator. So this, this was activated last Tuesday, or I mean last Thursday night. Um, I want to take it back home. Now, one of the other things they recommend, and I always get asked, can it be reused? Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with this. Some woods will tend to stain the resin, will make it a little darker. It has no impact on the resin, it will still work. It might, you might not want to do holly uh, with it the next time around, but one of the things that uh, most of the chemical manufacturers will tell you is it's probably not the best idea in the world to mix the used resin with the new resin. I think they say that so they can sell more new resin because I have done it for two years now, and I've never had a drop of trouble with it. Now, some of the resin will get pretty nasty. I've, I've done some really punky wood, and, and I'll just take some cheesecloth and, and, and filter it to get some of the junk out of it, but I've never had a drop of trouble with it. The dye, oftentimes, and, and by the way, the PVC chambers, you can dye all you want to all day long in that, and I strongly recommend that when you dye, that you mix a full gallon at a time because I sell the stuff. Uh, however, if it's me, I'm going to mix the absolute minimal amount of resin necessary with that dye, and I'm going to put it in a container. These were done literally in a quart jar, an open quart jar, with resin covering them about that much, and I just set it inside the chamber, okay? Okay. Any more questions? Be happy to stay around and talk with you about it. Is this on now? Yeah. All right, thank you. Can we also have some people help us pick up the chairs a little bit?